Some record button. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Mikasa Sukasa Sports Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Finn. Uh, today, I'm really excited to uh, bring a guest onto the show. Uh, in about a week, the World Cup uh, soccer tournament, international soccer tournament, is going to be starting. And I got a special guest on who's got a big background in soccer. This is Brandon Ponchak. Brandon Ponchak is a general manager and assistant coach for the Cincinnati Dutch Lions. They are a PDL soccer team. We'll get into that. Uh, he's coached across multiple colleges uh, for men's and women's soccer across the Midwest. And uh, he had his playing career as a goalkeeper uh, for Asbury University, as well as playing in some international tournaments there in Sweden. So how are you doing today, Brandon? Good. How's it going? Thanks for having me. Man, no problem. And for those of you guys who don't know, I'm related to Brandon, so this was a pretty easy connection. I don't have these, you know, these plug hookup deals with college coaches. I just happen to be related to you, so... <laughs> The facial hair gives it away, I think. It runs. It runs, man. So um, first thing I want to hop into is what you're doing, um, coaching and as general manager for the Cincinnati Dutch Lions. Now, the first thing is they're part of the PDL. For most people like me and other people uh, who are kind of casual soccer fans, we know about the MLS. Tell me a little bit about what the PDL, what the goal is for it, and then what your kind of role is for that team is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the PDL is the highest level of amateur soccer in the United States. It, uh, it stands for Premier Development League, and it's been around for over 25 years. Uh, currently, there's over 74 teams across the United States and, and even a couple in Canada as well. And the whole goal to the PDL is their simple hashtag path to pro. Uh, and it's a pro development league. Uh, we we aim to grab guys. Uh, there's no age restriction. We we just try to grab guys and gear them and ready for professional soccer and uh, increase their exposure. You know, like kind of like any other job, I, I relate it. Like in soccer, you have to expand your resume, and this is just another resume boost uh, for aspiring professional soccer players. Yeah, that's perfect. That sounds good. And that's kind of what I wanted to bring you on to talk about today is this, the development. The last podcast I had uh, was a girl named Hallie Hetz. She's a, a hockey journalist. And you know me, I'm from the South, man. So I didn't really like, I'm not really a hockey guy at all. Hockey, a hockey guy. Yeah, that shows you right there that I don't know jack about hockey. But um, she was talking about all the different leagues, the Ontario Hockey League and all the different ones they have here. So same thing I wanted to bring out from you. So you said no age restrictions. Now, is there kind of like a, like a gentleman's agreement on how young you can go? Or is it how, – how, what is the prime age group that you guys are looking for for talent? Um, and, and what is probably the lowest that you guys have seen bringing guys, guys in? I, um, this is my second year in, with the Cincinnati Dutch Lions. I joined last uh, in, in March of 2017. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us, we've had 17-year-olds with us. We, we're current, we have – a 17 year old with us currently we had one with us last year uh we competed against a 15 year old and a 16 year old uh actually a 16 year old won goal of the month last june uh, oh, nice. for the whole league which was pretty incredible um i would venture to say that the average age is probably around 20 years old okay. uh, the college age is really the target market for the teams um, guys that are right there probably on the cusp of uh, grabbing a professional contract. Right. Um, the oldest, I think, is around 27 years old that, that I've really seen. Okay. Uh, we actually have two 27-year-olds with us right now. Uh, one has experience in La Liga, uh, which is pretty incredible. And, uh, you know, we, we played against one last year that was a center back, and he had three years of experience in MLS. Uh, so it, it's – a wide variety of, of, of ages and talent and, and backgrounds. I mean, there's no, there's, there's not really a restriction on international spots. So you, you have guys with loads of international experience coming in. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's not something I expected. Having not heard about it, I didn't expect a guy to pop in. Cause I mean, especially in maybe like premier league and a lot of, there's so many divisions. So it's like, if you're not good enough to play at the top, you could just kind of hop down. I didn't even think about them coming over here. It's playing something like the PDL. Um, so does this have any effect on, especially for like the younger guys, the 17 and 18 year olds on their um, college eligibility? Um, 
is there kind of a risk reward for them going to the PDL instead of going to a university and playing for a college? Or could they play with you guys through 17, 18, maybe high school soccer in their area or whatever? Is it cutting it for development? They play with you guys and then spend some time in the, in the NCAA circuit. Yeah. So our league is, is sanctioned by U.S. soccer as an amateur league. Okay. So ever like the whole league as as a whole is amateur. There are some teams that do pay their players. Okay. Uh, that doesn't affect players if you compete against them. So uh, amateurism really falls when you really start playing in college. Right. So as long as the general rule is you can't play with professionals on your team, but you can play against them. So, you know, at 16, 17 years old, their amateurism stuff is really safe. Uh, I remember years ago when MLS ran their reserve league uh, and some of it was unofficial and some of it was official and they would, they would play some of their academy kids with their, with their first team reserves. Mm -hmm. Um, And they kept amateur status. So that's, that's very similar to what we are. Our season operates in the summertime. So uh, kind of a May kickoff and and, uh, the championship game, is always the first weekend, the first Saturday in August. Okay. So it really fits a gap where there's not much soccer uh, for college athletes, but also mm-hmm. high school athletes uh, or, you know, prep athletes, you know, club you know, right. age. Gotcha. Find some time to, to maybe take off and play in the off season for their main sport. Uh, is there a way that we could find – PDL games, are they like uploaded to YouTube or a special website or something? Or is it just kind of kept low key? You got to see it in person or, or maybe they have game tape there that's available to teams and scouts. Every, every team operates completely different. We actually stream all of our home games, which is pretty sweet. Um, we've averaged so far, we've had three home games and we've averaged over 700 viewers per home game. Right. Um, and it's, it's international as well uh, for somehow, some way we have some huge following in Turkey. Uh, And it's really strange because I think it was the second home game and the whole chat on on YouTube, we stream ours through YouTube. And the whole chat on YouTube was all Turkish. And it was, I mean, we have no idea how or why it come about, but um, the league does a very good job of promoting the streams when when there are some. So if if when the team stream and they, they link the streams you can always find it on uslpdl.com gotcha. and, uh, or Twitter, which is the league is very active on Twitter. And it's, it's, it's really easy to find it that way. And, and hopefully the teams are just as active in marketing and promoting their live streams as well. We are. I mean, and I think that's part of the reason why we have over 700 live viewers on a, you know, on a regular basis. Gotcha. So as a general manager and assistant coach, um, I mean, obviously from, I guess, not obviously, but from my perspective, general manager has always kind of been uh, personnel. You know, I've always seen it as the general manager's job is to place people with the coaches or coaching staff with the people that they feel are going to be best fits for the team running a system. Is that kind of how you run it? What's kind of your role there as a general manager on the team? And then also go ahead and hop into like what you're doing, coaching on the team. Um, you know, if it's a position group or, or how does that work for you guys? Yeah. So I, I came in last, last March, like I mentioned in, in 17 and I was a director of operations, uh, just kind of looking at transitioning out of college coaching. And, and this was an opportunity that presented itself. Uh, to pursue a higher level, nothing that I really thought mm-hmm. much about, but it was like, hey, let's do it. Um, and it was a great jump. And then the head coach resigned. He took a Division One assistant coaching job, and it was closer to home for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we, we did a lot of things turnover with the team. They, in 16, they had one win. Uh, in 17, we finished just one game under 500. And so it was a great move for the club. He stepped down in July, so we had like several months in 17 that toward the end, it was like, what's going to be the next step for our club is, and coach and all that stuff. And we were very fortunate to get uh, a retired pro- professional player in Paul Nicholson, who just retired from FC Cincinnati. He was one of the first 11 players with FC Cincinnati. He had a long career in USL. Uh, I think he's still currently in the top five of all-time minutes played in USL history. Mm-hmm. So a remarkable 
you know, career that he had. Um, and he, we brought him on as a head coach. And gotcha. we, it, it's kind of a dual thing that we do. Um, he's got great ties from his pro days and college coaching as well uh, that he's, he's in, in his agent, you know, like very connected with coaches and players. He's a coach. We're going to let, you know, we, we let him choose who he wants and the system that he wants. And right. we, we, we tag team him a little bit as well. So if I can find some guys here or there, I can find some guys. We just want to make sure we're getting guys that's going to take us our club to the next level. But also we're going to get guys that we can, we hope are pro level capable right. um, to continue that path to pro that we've, that we've had. And we've, um, we've had nine players sign pro in the last four years from our club. Oh, wow. And then USL and MLS are two different leagues, correct? Yep. That's right. Gotcha. And they're two pro leagues. Just yep. so I know what we're talking about here on the pro league. Like I said, I've only ever known the MLS. And that's one of the big things I'm going to talk to you about is not just player development. I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing differently than, say, Premier League or La Liga or, or I mean, pretty much any, any team ever. Obviously. Any, yeah. Any yeah. other kind of um, Right. So give us a rundown about like what they do. I mean, I kind of know, but I figured I'd hear it from the horse's mouth here. And then um, what do you feel U.S. soccer could do better? Should we mimic it? Um, because it seems very all in the way that they do it. And I guess I'll go ahead and talk about it and you can kind of correct it. So guys, um, in all of these other countries, they run these youth academies and they really get these guys. They start recruiting young, young. I mean, greatest soccer player in the world, Lionel Messi, they were finding him at six, seven years old. Uh, and getting him over into these youth academies and raising these kids in a system, um, whether it be just how they want players to develop, whether it be a specific system on how they play and strategy and scheme on the field. They really build these guys up. Yeah, they'll send them on loan um, to other teams here and there so that they can get some playing time, especially if they're not quite good enough to be at their, their top, their first team is a, what would it be called. Um, but really, you're, it's a homegrown kind of system. You're building a guy from the age of six, seven years old to be your star when he's 19, 20 years old, and then up until obviously he retires, ideally. Um, or you can send him away and make a bunch of money. I don't know. Um, different ways to do it. Um, is that kind of the cycle? Am I missing anything there in, in the development um, for, the, for the other countries? Oh, no. That's, I mean, that's the, the clubs around the world. I mean, of course, they've had many years of, of trials and tribulations with it. And a lot of different mentalities when a, when a new manager comes in, how are the, how's the rest of the club going to shape? Um, in the U S yeah. I mean, it's, it's really just been a top down sort of setup, whatever MLS has wanted. And it kind of trickled down from there. Um, USL has somehow been able to do what they've done for, you know, almost 30 years I think you know in some sh some way shape or form it started in like 1988 1989 USL did not mm -hmm. under the USL name it's since changed a couple times right. but it's essentially the same league mm -hmm. um, so they've been operating and, and there's been some successful teams for years and years uh, and then you know they've they've either either had to fold or you know somehow they've ended up moving up to MLS by gra grabbing some some wealthy benefactor to help them get a franchise and, and move to MLS. Um, it, it's, it's a bit of a fractured system. Uh, there's, there's a very little uh, scouting network. There's very little in terms of that path, that path to pro, um, you know, with, with very few professional teams in the United States. I mean, I think we're around 56 professional teams in the United States uh, with, the second most youth players in the world right. uh, um, only behind China, you know, just by sheer numbers uh, that it's, we don't have the, the proper structure that's going to help us identify and move players through the system to give them right. opportunity to continue to develop our national team. Right. And just, I think, not only that, but just because of the way other sports work, not soccer, that we do things, you know, we have this system, it's high school, maybe play some travel ball while you're in high school, whether it be a basketball AAU team or uh, for football, they're starting these sevens teams um, for all those mini camps that they have. I mean, football is a harder because you're putting your body in such shock to get right, so right. much um, soccer, travel, baseball, travel. And then go to college and, you know, the American dream, your degree while you're a sport and then get drafted into your league. Yeah, but then you're 22, 23 years old 
and you're so far behind these guys in development. And I think it's a huge, do you think, I don't think it's a lack of athletes. You made a good point, right? Where we just have so many people. I mean, our country's huge and sure we're going to lose some of the potential athletes to basketball. We're going to lose some of these potential speedsters to track and football, the sports that are really going to get people going. Nobody's really showing up to the men's soccer teams. Um, if you go to a random high school, um, but there has to be something wrong with the way we're developing in that there's probably, uh, I can't name five to 10 people that are in, you know, the premier league or Lally. I mean, obviously, and, and I'm going to shred names here. I know of Josie Altador, um, who was the, started with the C. He was like the main guy for team USA for a while. Oh man. He was playing. He's played at Everton. Not Tim Howard or Tim Howard, and then there's the, the, the <laughs> man. What was his name? I think Clint Dempsey. He wasn't at Everton. Oh, yeah. all right, Clint Dempsey. Yeah. Uh, don't tell me where Clint. Uh, he wasn't Everton. Uh, was it Tottenham? Yeah, and Fulham. Oh, yeah, he was at Fulham as well. Yeah, yeah. Fulham. I know a little bit of soccer, man. Mm -hmm. um, there's the young man that's uh, at uh, Borussia Dortmund. Yeah, yeah, Pulisic. Yeah, but he is. Uh, did he come from like an American system and play and grew up in America? Yeah. Or is he just multinational? It, it's really funny to to hear people debate about him. Um, okay. I mean, he was no doubt about it. He was he's he's been in the U.S. youth system for for years. I mean, he was identified. He was playing in the youth national teams early, fourteen, sixteen years old. Mm -hmm. um, he played in. Uh, Pitt, P PA Classics, Pennsylvania Classics. He's from Hershey, PA. Mm -hmm. And uh, like he, he was never identified in, in saying, hey, you should be playing in this MLS system ever, mm -hmm. uh, as, as far as I know. And it, it's funny how he can, he's good enough to play at Dortmund at 17, 18 years old. Right. But not good enough to play in Philadelphia Union at 16 years old. Yeah. Like, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me and that's that's where i think some of the aspects that u.s soccer is missing on is identifying those young talent yeah. and getting them playing the highest level possible that they can manage for their development in a positive aspect do you uh, think it's uh, more physical talent or mental talent i mean obviously the game is very very mental um do you feel like the issue is more so finding kids with the physical tools to do something or finding kids that just have it from a mental perspective or is it kind of a blend of both? I, I think they, I think there's plenty of kids that can do it. I, I have no doubt in my mind. And, and some of these, these players have managed to get overseas and, and early the Pulisic, the uh, Weston McKinney's and, and, and several other guys um, that have done the same. It's, they've been fortunate. I mean, Pulisic was be one of the first ones to say, He's a little fortunate because I, I think he's got a Croatian passport, you oh. know, so it made his transition to Europe easier because he could identify as a European player. Interesting. Yeah. I was wondering that how, how he was able to transition so smooth. So did he go through their youth Academy at all? Or did he was just playing no. in high school? And no. just like no, he, grew, yeah, he, he grew up in the, the PA classics and, uh, and, you know, at one, at some point, his, I mean, his dad's a, a well-known coach. He's a professional coach in the States now. He was with the Dortmund Academy as well right. uh, when Christian made his first move over there. But, I mean, he, he is a product of the American system. Um, it, it's, not, it's not like a fault of the American system. That mm -hmm. I mean, to some extent, it is a fault of the American system that there's not more identified. Right. But – he was fortunate that he had family and the capabilities to make that move abroad. Not everybody has those capabilities. And it's pretty tough when you have 25 million soccer players in the whole U S mm -hmm. to, to stand out when you only have 56 professional teams. Right. And, and the mass scouting base isn't even in that sport per se. And you're really, once we talked about it before, kind of you're getting, the athletes that are kind of trickling through the cracks because they're all the top guys are going towards the more money making sports. Um, especially, yeah, this, I, from what I remember, salary in the MLS is it's not strong, it's not very strong, it's not very appeasing. Mm -hmm. But obviously, getting over there, there's another young man way back in the day. Uh, and by way back in the day, I mean like 10 years ago. Um, he was like an, uh, he was an American, he grew up in Jersey, um, but he also was Italian. 
and he actually played he actually i believe he didn't play for team usa i believe he chose to play for i think his name started with a g giuseppe um, giuseppe rossi yes that's who it was yeah yeah italian, yeah, italian. But yeah, but I remember, I remember he seeing that, and then of course the whole Freddie Adu thing. Everybody thought he was the next Pele. Um, but even him, I don't remember. Didn't he not have American? Or he was American, but his descent came from. He came from Ghana. Yeah, right? yeah, he had Ghana roots, and I don't know if they these, but they found their way, and I think around the DC metro area. Right, them boys from Ghana are big. Yeah, yeah. I worked with a guy, and man was about six seven, two thirty, just pure rock. And all he did, he was very finesse whenever he, whenever I watched him play. Those, it's just a whole different breed. And maybe kind of talk about that a little bit before we get into the strategy. You did some uh, – this international tournament in Sweden. Uh, you've been exposed to guys, like you said, that have had some uh, Liga experience, probably some international players. What is just different about those guys um, versus here and, and the way that they play? I think the first thing – in my in, in my experiences that I've sensed from it, um, it's the culture that they bring. It's a mentality from the culture that they're all about the game. Everything they do is about the game, mm-hmm. and it and part of that comes from where they grew up because that's you know that's they grew up around the game. Their friends grew up around the game. Their parents might have grew up around the game, but at some point they they've brought that culture onto themselves. Uh, and that's, I think that's kind of where I was. I, I mean, I never grew up around the game. My parents never played. I didn't have, I mean, I, I ended up having friends that played, but it, it really just took grasp. I mean, took hold of my whole life and everything I was doing that, that, that needs to be adapted more so with American players. Right. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I, that we're talking with coaches, whether it's college, high school club of, how many American players don't watch the game? Yes. That's that, so huge. Yeah. I mean, it's part of the culture. And you talk to any other country and the players are coming, it, they, they watch the game. I mean, I, I worked with a professional team and one of their leading goal scorers come out. I mean, he would say that he hate, hated playing soccer. Really? He was a professional soccer player and he hated playing soccer. But he did it and he made some money doing it. So he just kept mm-hmm. doing it. Interesting. He didn't have a long career out of it, mm-hmm. probably because that was part of the aspect, his mentality. But and and there's some aspects that that influence and enhance that culture and that mentality. And I think it starts right at the top and where MLS is at, and it trickles down. And this is the trickle down that I think I recently saw something that said MLS teams and the players play on average. 10 less games than English Premier League counterparts. So at the top level, they're already playing 10 less competitions in their, with their club than what we are. I mean, like we are playing 10 less than what they are. Right. And that continues to trickle down. You look at college and at the prime, some would say the prime of, of some athletes career that 18 to 22 years old, mm-hmm. our colleges. And I don't, I, I'm not going to fault them 100%, but our colleges only play 18 to 20 games on average a season. Mm-hmm. And when you're only playing 18 to 20 games a year, mm-hmm. like the international athlete is playing 36 to 46 games at the mm-hmm. same age level. Mm-hmm. And that's a huge hindr- hindrance. Um, and then you take it another step farther down and in high school. And high school in the United States is all spread out. I, I coached in South Dakota. There were teams in South Dakota that only played 10 high school games in their high school season. Right. And then there's others in the States that play 22 mm-hmm. high school games in their regular season. And it's that gap doesn't help an athlete develop. Right. And in, in my research and the studies I've done with other sports, that gap doesn't exist with other sports like it does with soccer. Right. Football, you know, in, in high school football, you're probably playing 10 games a season. Right. But in college, games. what's that go to? It goes to 12 or 13. Right. That's, that's two game difference. And in right. pros, it goes to 16. Right. Like, there should be a natural progression of the differences in games, 
But when our top level in soccer are already playing 10 games less than international players, we're already set back. Right. That can and that's just from player learning and giving them chances to learn. And even more so in soccer because it's so free-flowing and it's so quick. Like for football, um, you know, I've, I've done a little bit of coaching. Well, you'll pay for a big or bad play or a bad scenario, but you have a six-second window to be out of position. You know what I'm saying? Six to ten-second window. It's heavily scripted. Offense, especially offense, is so heavily scripted that it's not really hard as long as you prep and learn throughout the week. Whereas in soccer, it's so easy to – I would just imagine soccer IQ is just so easy to just lose yourself track. I feel like it's so more important. And people don't really realize that. We just think it's kicking and running. That guy's really fast and that guy's you – know, you know, but, but positioning, knowing what your role is, knowing you need to get back, need to get up where you need to be for passing lanes, how to play passing lanes on defense. I just feel like it's so much harder. And you're right. I feel like you need more games to learn it. And, and, when, and when you're setting yourself back by five, ten games a year, mm-hmm. you, I mean, you're, or you already handicapped yourself. Right. This might be weird. I want to know what your thought is on this. So I think the younger generation, this generation coming up in high school and stuff, is in a better position um, – for that to find guys that have more reps, right? The big thing in football right now uh, has been virtual reality reps, right? Putting on these things, um, running through reps after practice. Um, that way you're essentially doing work without working your body. That's some of the big things that's going around the NFL, some colleges. Ooh, love the sneeze. I think FIFA, the video game, is something that's really helping. It's really what got my youngest brother, Trenton, uh, his soccer IQ, very smart player. He doesn't have all the physical tools, but it's, I don't think I've ever seen him get truly beat in terms of positioning. He plays defender now. He plays right back and left back. But I don't think I've ever seen him mess up position. Now, then again, I don't have the eye for coaching, so let me not say that he's never messed up. But when he gets beat, it's a one-on-one scenario where he just gets beat by a guy who's faster than him, beats a guy, you know, just got better ball skills or whatever, muscles him. Yeah. But I think these it's reps, but it's not reps. The kids aren't thinking of it as reps, but you made a point. Like kids aren't watching soccer. Americans aren't really, these guys aren't, you know, day in, day out watching because those are reps. If you, if you really think about it, learning the IQ, learning why people are doing things and getting to the X's and O's of a sport is why. And I think FIFA is something that's huge because it's hands-on. Um, and it, it, for those that really use it, sort of the tool it can be, help them out. And I think that rising up generation, just being exposed to more soccer than the one to two practices a week. And then the yeah. 10 games a season, you know, you're just being exposed to more. Then you learn the players that you're playing with. You're like, Oh, this messy guy's really good. Or this Cristiano Ronaldo's guy's really good. Want to want to watch him in real life. Yada, yada, yada. And then through the last, you know, 10 years, USA soccer is getting better and better. And there's my smooth transition into this conversation. Right then USA soccer just plummets. <laughs> now is, what's his name? Pulisic. Yeah. Pulisic, is, he, yeah. is he playing for team USA? Yeah. Yeah. He's there right now. Um, so what is I mean, it's really, it, what's going on it's, with us? It's really heartbreaking to hear and read about when us lost to Trinidad and Tobago and, and Pulisic. I mean, I think it was Dax McCarty just come out and said, he's like, you walk into the locker room and, and Pulisic's in the showers fully clothed, sobbing in his hands. Right. And that's not a mentality that every player has in America. Right. Um, Landon Donovan straight up said when his retirement interview, his first retirement interview, like he wasn't willing to give soccer everything he had. I mean, he said that. And that's just, you know, Landon did tremendous for the U.S. And, oh, yeah. you know, I don't want to take anything away from what he was able to do. Phenomenal. But – some of part of me thinks is, man, what if he had that mentality of he's going to do everything he could, right. what kind of player could he have been and what kind of impact could he have had even more for American soccer players? Right. We weren't far that removed from, I mean, almost putting Portugal in the group stage out. And it was just so wild to see this transition. So we were talking about this before the podcast. So, just so you guys that don't know, we talked about the World Cup coming up here in a week. Team USA is not in it from what I've seen. We're not going to be competing this year. 
obviously there was a, a manager change, right? From uh, Jurgen Klinsmann, who's the manager now? There isn't one officially. Okay, so we're not there yet. Well, I mean, with us not competing. Yeah, they, they have an interim. They have an interim manager who was an assistant coach uh, previously under Bruce Arena, um, who took over for Jurgen Klinsmann. So he's been named the interim um, for the foreseeable future. And I think some of the mindset behind the, the hiring committees, the GM, U.S. soccer, is they're going to wait until after the World Cup before they really have a national team coach. Why brush it? What are we, what are we winning right now, you know? Um, but at the, at the same time, we, what national team has been without a national team coach – uh, they, you know, since November really is when we, we, when Bruce Arena was, was, was gone. Um, you know, so we're what, eight months and now we're going to wait for two more months potentially. And what national team is successful without having a visionary leader as a manager, um, right. for 10 months. Right. Exactly. Cause that's just, you're just 10 months behind just everything, just everything from player management, Picking the guys you want, setting a system, training, it's all behind because they're going to have to come in and start ground zero anyways. Um, so let's turn away from Team USA here to the World Cup. Who are your favorites? I'll go first. I think this is the year Leo does it. And the reason why is I just look at all the Spain guys, and I, I, I will say this. I haven't peaked the roster, so I don't know how up-to-date this is, right? Um, but I just think all the Spanish names, I just think they're – I just think they're older. I think Messi's right, just playing balls to the wall soccer. Um, they're coming off of a crazy season in Barcelona where they were almost undefeated. I think they lost their like last game of the yeah. season. Yeah. They almost went through the entire La Liga. I mean, this isn't I mean, these aren't chumps, you know. This is Real Madrid, you know, one of the best clubs. They just won the Champions League. Um and then, you know, you got Atletico Madrid, um, which had I mean was Fernando Torres still playing for them last time I checked? But they have great players out there. Um, and they won they, they won Europa League. Right. I'm pretty sure. So, yeah. um, I mean, it, it's crazy. And I think that this is the year that Leo does it. I mean, I think uh, – I, I don't – I mean, you'd never have to count out – you can never really count out Spain. You can never really count out Germany. That's definitely, definitely a team that you can't count out. Who do you have – who do you think the stars of the tournament are going to be? Because obviously – Last World Cup was what four years ago? Is it every four years? Yep. Yeah. So obviously, last one, yeah. You know, I last. I mean, the last stars of Germany I remember were Thomas Muller. You know, those kind of guys. Um, shoot, the the dude that was playing for. Uh, I mean, Marco Royce is on Germany, correct? Mm -hmm. So all those guys. Um, I remember the team was so stacked. There was a midfield midfielder. He was at Bayern Munich, and he went to Borussia Dortmund. Can't remember his name, but he didn't even make the team because it was just so stacked. Um, but, but yeah, no, I'll, I'll quit the land. Who do you, who do you got winning? Who are your stars in the tournament going to be? I, I think it's easy to say it every time. I mean, especially right now, Germany, Spain, um, are definitely some the front runners. Um, Brazil could come out and surprise a lot if they get things together. If Neymar gets so things, together. um, I know they're, they're going to want to, have a better cup, you know, and not get drubbed eight one or whatever it was by seven one. And it was pretty, yeah, so, but I don't, I think you play that game back. It doesn't happen. It's just one of those right falling down, falling down, falling down. Yeah. So, so I mean, I think that they, they could get some tools together to really, to, to make a nice run. Um, I don't see Argentina. I don't, I don't see Argentina doing it. I, I mean, really? It'd be great for Messi. I mean, their wall was Germany last time, right? Did they get as far and then just ran into Germany, and that was that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, and and they had some great performances. You know, like Mascherano, to me, was was probably their best player. Um, right. for the, I mean, he was absolutely lights out defensively. Uh, they're going to have to have some equal performances to, to, to do that, to make another run like that. And, right. and Messi's going to have to have some additional help around Right, uh, as always. And I don't – I mean, they got Aguero. Um, you got Di Maria out there, but I don't I don't know. None of those guys have played with him before. So, 
And Messi, I don't know. Has Messi always kind of been seen as a system guy? Do they always? Does anybody feel like Messi could step away from the Barca system and perform? I mean, obviously, the only time we have seen that before has been the Argentina team, and there's been times where it feels like anything he disappears. I mean, I just wish we can get Cristiano's body and Messi's like ability and just. Yeah. I mean, Messi's already the greatest of all time, in my opinion. And I, I didn't bring you on here to go Messi Cristiano. Um, do you? But let's go to Cristiano. Do you feel like Portugal has a chance at all, or do you think it's just one of those, just like Argentina, where it's just like you're just kind of riding the coattails of a star player? Yeah, that. And you know, if they have some other good performances, I know in in 14 they needed more from Nani. Um, mm-hmm. They got some here or there, but they're they're going to have to have somebody else step up with with Cristiano and, and follow suit. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it'll be interesting. I mean, I, I wish I was able to, uh, to give a little bit more accurate with it, but, uh, world cup's always going to be bringing some surprises. Uh, Russia is going to be bringing some surprises as the host country. <laughs> and, the last time and, they hosted something like this, all their athletes got bumped for steroids. <laughs> so it, it, it'll be very interesting to see what that's going to bring. And, and hopefully it's going to be, everybody's going to be safe and it's going to be a great, world cup um and that we'll we'll see some some real surprises maybe we'll see it'd be great to see messi you know i I mean it'd be great to see messi perform and and win a world cup um to solidify for those that that best you know like right and i'm not one of those that ever argues that or or argues for or against it because i just think it's great to watch him play it's great to have two players like him and ronaldo both performing at the levels they do um but it's also great I mean, in my mind to see teams like Iceland uh, do what oh, I right. And, you know, you, you could look 10 years ago and you'd be like, <laughs> they're clab. Could, could you awesome. ever, I mean, would anybody ever predicted Iceland to do what they did um, in the last two tournaments, you know, in the Euros and now, you know, making a world cup, the smallest country ever to make the world cup. I believe it now after watching uh, Leicester city. I believe yeah. anything you told me. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that was great. So, um, all right. So, any under – like any Cinderella – I mean, is Iceland your Cinderella team, if you, if you had to pick one? I've, just, I've studied Iceland for, for several years now. Before they really become the, the Cinderella, the, the, the sweet story that everybody likes to see, I, I've, I've, I've restudied them. I don't know how I come on to them, but it was just one of those things I mean, – as a coach, I just try to study around and, and see what's working, what's not working, how, how people have grown the game. I mean, that's one thing from Iceland that, that I think the U.S. Soccer Federation could really kind of step back and look at how they've been able to grow the game there. Right. Uh, I mean, they've, they've bumped up. And the FIFA World Rankings are always debatable. It, it's not about where they're ranked. But they've bumped up like 60, 70 spots in the last – you know, five to 10 years. Gotcha. That's, that's not by accident. And, and uh, it's, it's really by a lot of the moves that the Federation's done. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I researched it through those years. Like it, it's been awesome to see what they've, they've done and the players that they've been able to produce. Right. And the um, culture that they've been able to build. So, I mean, I, I like Iceland. I, I think it, it'd, be, it'd be great to see them do well. Cinderella team. So winner being Germany or Spain. I'm putting you on record here so that you can get blasted on Twitter by my Yeah. I think that's what viewers. Germany or Spain. I know I know it's not really, you know, a it's bold not, dinner I mean, or anything like that. But you ask the, the NFL would be Patriots equals a Rams, you know, or whatever. Like Yeah. Like I mean I mean so mad at you for picking the two best teams as the favorite uh, winner. I'm never gonna go out on a, a, a huge limb and say, Oh look, now we're gonna have Mexico win a World Cup. Like right, right. now. That's not just – they're not going to ride Carlos Vela from Gallup, <laughs> you know, to the World Cup trophy. Like, this is not going to happen. Got you. Um, so, next time we'll talk about strategy. That's what it was. I wrote it right here. So, I guess the first thing I'll ask you for some soccer strategy questions, because you could probably go for years and years and years. And what I would love to have you could back on is maybe I, I do these film review videos for football, and I just have some tape up, and I just talk about – what I know from my experience coaching, it would be great to have you on. And then we could be like, here, pause, see where he's at, see where he's at, see where he's at. This is why this worked, yada, yada, yada. So I know we could go all day. Um, 
formations in soccer, right? There's a lot of them. But one of the prime things we see, and always I've wanted the question answered is, I've seen formations with three defensive players, with five defensive players, and then the more standard four defensive players. What are the pros and cons to those different types? Obviously, you could be three, four, three, and it, or it could be like three, two. Well, I don't know. There's so many things for it. So obviously that may change the game a little bit. But what are the, I guess, what are you getting when you have three back versus five back? And then what are you losing? What do you, what's your risk reward there? Well, the first thing with formations is it's really just a starting point. Okay. Uh, and as you mentioned and alluded to earlier, soccer is so free-flowing that unlike what a lot of youth league coaches in the States say, just because you're a defender doesn't mean you stay at the top of the box like a cone and you are one person that's going to be around you. Um, around the world in the higher levels and, 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 and when, you, when you get into coaching, it – a defender can can score goals. I mean, a defender's going to get forward. A defender's going to get wide. A defender's going to get into the midfield. Um, so, to me, it's just a starting position, a starting place. And what what coaches will want to do is they want to make sure that they can get their best players um, on the field all at the same time. Mm -hmm. But also they want to get their best players that can play together on the field at the same time. Okay. And if that happens to be with three backs – and you say you got three solid de central defenders that can do it, then then that's kind of the route they may take. And then they'll they'll throw outside, you know, outside backs or wing backs or outside midfielders, whatever somebody wants to call them and, and whatever the system. And they could be, you know, uh, complementary to those three central defenders in a in a three back system. So it really it it, it depends on the the tactics, the, the game, the personnel that you want to get on the field at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe also what your opponent throws at you. Right. Uh, I remember the one time that I'd ever really say that a formation could, could have potentially won us a game. Uh, I was in college and uh, coach, we were playing a top 10 team in the country and a uh, coach went out with the Christmas tree formation as a four, three, two, one. You know, so it looked like a Christmas tree. Right. And uh, we ended up getting a one nil win over them and it was huge for us. And, and it, I do believe that a lot of it revolved around our formation and how they couldn't break us down because it, it's not something that they, they, they saw before. Mm. Um, so some of that can, can play a part as well. I mean, there's coaches and, and I'm kind of one at times that I like a formation. I want to stick with it and I want to get players that can play that formation. Gotcha. Uh, but at the same time as coaches, we got to adapt to the situations and players that they may come in differently than what we thought they were going to come in. Uh, so we got to change our system in that way. I mean, so far in our PDL system, our PDL season this year, uh, we went from a 3-4-3 three, three to a 4-3-3 three, three to a 4-4-2. Four, four, right. And it all revolved around personnel and getting the best 11 that play together on the field at the same time. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, you know, some there's always things that can change that injuries, uh, whatever else happens. You know, like there's there's always those outside things that affect, you know, rosters. So, for sure. Um, so obviously that means communication, which has always been mind boggling to me that you could have a guy on a team. This is more so for Europe or, you know, even Brazil or anywhere, you know, I mean, you got guys like you know, Samuel Eto who is playing in what Russia, you know, um, but he's from, you know, somewhere in Africa and all these guys. So do you happen to have, ex I mean, maybe you saw it from playing or maybe just know how did these guys really communicate? Do they normally have like a central language like English or maybe the language of the country they're in um, to run with? Maybe that's what they're doing at these youth academies on their off days when they're not training is learning languages or at least a way to communicate with other people. Cause it seems chaotic, you know, I'm passing to a guy from, you know, and it's coming into America as well. Obviously is Latan, you know, um, can speak, uh, English. Uh, I mean, it's probably easy for him, you know, pass to Latan and let's, <laughs> you're welcome, you know, <laughs> um, and, which is still the most bother thing I've ever seen, seen. So you guys, I don't know. Um, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, he's this man. I mean, how tall is he? Six, seven, six, six. He's tall. He's from Sweden. And he is 
when we talk about some of the greatest players of all time, I don't know where he is, but I think he's one of the most wow players of all time. You know, he's got the iconic bicycle kick over Joe Hart in, uh, against England um, from about damn near half field, just okay. cranks his bicycle kick in. Um, I mean, if you thought the, the Bale one was good in the Champions League final, that's the one. Uh, he's got some crazy footwork goals from his early days when he was playing. Uh, I don't know where he was playing. It was his red and white jerseys. I know he spent a lot of time in Italy playing. Um, he's played for Inter Milan. He's played for PSG. He's played with in Messi with Barcelona, or yeah, with Messi in Barcelona, um, and then he's played for Manchester United. Well, anyways, he's uh, he's a very confident individual, and he comes over to the MLS to play for. Uh, is it for the Galaxy or is it for LAFC? It is Galaxy. Galaxy. Yeah. All right. I know LAFC is its own entity now. So he comes over to Galaxy, purchases his uh, front page, and he's well past his prime. He's somewhere in his mid-30s now. So many people, you know, many thought that he wouldn't be able to do it. He has this ability. I'm kind of rambling here. He Every, like, his first game on every new club, he always, like, scores. Like, that's just his thing. He always comes out and scores his first goal for his new club. And he purchases a page out of the uh, LA Times or whatever. And it's just like, you're welcome, right? Is that what it said? Just, mm-hmm. you're welcome. Like, Zlatan, you're welcome. I'm here. You're welcome, LA. And then he goes and he scores with, like, his first touch. Yeah. In this two, goals, two goals in his debut. Yeah. Two goals in his debut. One to win the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then one was, like, his first. He gets subbed on not 10, 15 seconds after he gets subbed on. He cranks this goal from mm-hmm. – Golly, so um, Zatan's up there. That's one of the stars. I kind of forgot where I was going with this. Oh, yeah, anyways, passing. So got guy from Sweden, guy from Germany, guy from Spain. How does that all work in terms of communicating with these guys? Yeah, a lot of it does revolve around understanding a certain language or at least certain terminologies that, that can get the job done. I mean, guys like Pep Guardiola, he'll go out and learn some languages to help out. Wow. Um, jo- Jose Mourinho, one of his first starts in, in the game um, in the coaching side was as a translator. Uh, mm. So he was able to help players understand and help coaches understand where everybody was at. So big clubs, they have that capability to, to get those extra people and positions for that. Uh, other aspects, they, they're going to require a certain language being spoke on the field or at certain times or – or whatever with that. So that, that helps. I mean, in the end, they're going to recruit players to the team that, that they believe are going to help them succeed in the system that they want to play, the similar styles that they want to play. And uh, that, that also will they, – they understand what their job is and their roles are in that system. Um, so they, they know it's a, a, it's a pretty easy transition for them to play in. Especially if they get them young. Yeah, absolutely. Like we talked about before, you know, like you have Argentina, Leo Messi going over to Spain to play for Barcelona. He's probably probably figured it out after his first couple of years there, what they really wanted from him. And that probably makes the process easier. Um, now, I had another strategy question. Yeah, goalkeeper. So you have some goalkeeper experience a little bit here and there. Um, outside, of, outside of getting all of the blame all of the time, and then watching you guys have the, uh, um, you know, after a goal, the frustration aired out or barking at people before a, a penalty kick or a free kick. Um, how much of a, a role does the goalkeeper have in terms of um, keeping personnel where it needs to be? Obviously, you're right there. Everything's in front of you. I see a lot of commands coming from the keeper. Is that kind of the, the guy that's – is it more so the defense he's in charge of, making sure he gets what he wants there? Um, you know, what's, what's his role on game day? Um, in terms of keeping the team where it needs to be? Yeah, a lot of it just revolves around that spine of the team. And it, it starts with the goalkeeper, it goes up to center back, goes to center mid. Um, and that, that's kind of where the, the team revolves around communication-wise and organizationally because they see the field. They're right in the middle of the action. Um, and, you know, the goalkeeper's there to, to get everybody else's back. They're there to help out their defense right in front of them. And it's kind of changed a little bit here or there at times with depending on where you're at and who you're talking to. It, 
growing up, it was always one of those, you got to communicate, you got to communicate. You always got to talk nonstop. And it, it, a lot of the communication can come from everybody. It doesn't always have to come from the goalkeeper. The goalkeeper can kind of help sure it up after everybody else has kind of done some things. And, and hopefully the mentalities are there. Of you don't have to tell everybody what to do all the time because they're smart enough to do it. They see it. They, a teammate helps them out as well. That, that a goalkeeper isn't necessarily barking all the time. So he gets drowned out. Mm-hmm. And that was one of those things that uh, growing up, uh, you always hear, like, you just always got to communicate. You always got to say stuff. It's like, at some point, your voice is going to go numb on the ears. Like, right. they won't listen because you, they hear it all the time, and it's just one consistent thing. Right. So, it, it, I mean, it's a goalkeeper's job. It's everybody's job to communicate. Um, and, and, you know, in and around the box, of course, it's a goalkeeper's domain, so they got to make sure that, everybody's where they should be and a lot of that revolves around if a goalkeeper the team needs to know where the goalkeeper's doing and what and the goalkeeper helps set that up so say hey force them this way i'll cover this side but as long as you're doing that job i can do my job right gotcha communication's key in every sport at every time and it's no different in soccer um well look man we we've been talking for a while um, I forgot a water, so yeah, I've been watching you drink, and my throat is just parched this whole time. But uh, I want to thank you for coming on the show today, man. Um, really informative stuff in terms of development, um, guys. If you had any interest in watching or and what we were talking about with development leagues and stuff like that, go check out the Cincinnati Dutch Lions. You can probably find them on Twitter somewhere or the YouTube universe. They said they stream all their live games. Is it YouTube streamed, or you guys got a website it streams on? Oh, YouTube. Yeah. Gotcha. Maybe through YouTube. So watch some soccer, watch some of the, so these guys, you know, they were under 500 by a game, right? Or over mm-hmm. 500. One game, yeah. Five, six, and three. Started out just a little rough this year. Um, but, it, I mean, we got 10 games left in this season, and right. the, the, the division's wide open. We got, we got some great personnel in right now. Um, gotcha. I mean, we definitely have a couple guys that are going to be signing pro contracts. So it, it's just getting everybody else together on the same page. And, mm-hmm. and I mean, right now we've, we've led almost every game in shots and out shooting our opponents. We just got to put some back in that. That's yeah. That's what it is. You know, you got 90 minutes to do the best job you can, you know, and sometimes it's hard to put good 92, you know, 90 straight minutes of good soccer together. So check that out. Um, really want to have you back on the show once again, and we can talk some okay. really deep dive and you can pull up some tape and, and kind of show us, and maybe we can do that, at, at, you know, once the World Cup has got some games in, and we can talk a little bit about that. Um, super excited. Remember, he said uh, Germany or Spain, so if he's wrong, you can find him on Twitter at, what is it, Pond, the Pond Chat? <laughs> I right. remember it was your blog it, back in yeah, the Yeah, that's it. It's, it's Pond Chat CDLFC right now. That's, right, Pond yeah, Chat CDLFC. CDLFC. Yep, give him a follow, ask him your soccer questions, berate him for having his bracket wrong. Um, but that's all we got for today, man. Uh, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah. If anybody has any questions, shoot them over to Finn and, you know, we'll, we'll come back and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, rehash everything again. And looking forward to the World Cup. Uh, yep. Four years is a long time to wait. And, and uh, it's even longer now that we don't have a U.S. to watch. Yeah. But at least now we can learn something more about these other countries instead of just getting drunk on Budweiser and cheering for a team of players we don't know about. <laughs> so, all right man well yeah. that's all we have here for this week so uh y'all take care look out we're going to be moving to itunes here soon so really excited about that so you don't have to look at my ugly face for an hour and a half uh so this was the mikasa sukasa sports podcast and uh we're out